I remember the first time I was called N-word and I knew what it meant. I don't know if I count this as racism, but people just straight away jump on, that's your genetics, that's them black genes. Nobody likes anyone if they look different from each other. I think last month I was on the way home, it was pretty late and somebody was driving by and they were like, oh, I can barely see you, but like they could see me enough to tell me, you know? I've been into the gym since I was a kid. I was always into like a few sports like Gaelic, hurling, football, maybe on the streets with everyone. I remember one stage I went to Africa with my parents and I remember just seeing a guy just walking around and he was just proper, just ripped like, you know, and just as a kid, like, you know, playing with action figures and all, you just see that, you're like, you know, I wanna, I wanna be like that kind of that type of way. So I got my mom to go over to him and like, he just kind of trained me for the last two weeks. And then after that, I just came back to Ireland then and joined the gym and I've always just loved it. like. My name is Gong Wu. I am a founder of Charu Korean Kitchen. Uh, Charu, I would say, is the bunch of people who love food, especially Korean food. We are aiming to open our uh, first restaurant in 2020. And this wonderful human is helping to lift many other spirits uh, out there. So please give loads of love and affection to the fantastic Philly Speaks. Yo! Oh damn, Stephen! <laughs> Stephen gives the best intros. Every time Stephen introduces me, I'm like, stop it! <laughs> yes! It is me! Thank you, Stephen. I think one of my first memories was I think I was about the same height as the Boss Aaron sticker. I remember direct provision. I remember glimpses and flashbacks of that. I remember the bright lights of Lidl when I arrived in Longford because we arrived at night time and we lived about a five minute walk across from it. One of my best mates used to live here. Uh, he works in the bar industry and he was the one who convinced me to move to Ireland. You know, the hospitality was growing so fast and I just saw like, well, that could be like a good opportunity, you know, for myself to give my ideas and then maybe start my own business. Most people that move over, move over for a better life. So my parents having us, they tried to give us the best opportunity really and they know by us coming over here, studying over here, living over here, we have a better chance, I think. What brought me here was my mom. She had a daughter, my sister, and she had a, a heart condition that nobody knew about. So the only two places to do the heart transplant was either Ireland or USA. Luckily, her husband was Irish, so it was easier to come to the country and get the heart transplant done. <laughs> This idea that why don't we just rent a, a room in town and we will meet there and just gonna come up with the creative ideas, be it the music production or you can do paintings or whatever. So I was always surrounded by creative people, but I never had the talent, you know, to create music or being a, being an artist. I was always the guy behind, you know, and that's that's I enjoy that role. <laughs> it wasn't even like that when we first started. It wasn't even like a thought of making a group. I met this dude, school trip, like back in like fucking third year or some shit. Ever since then, we're into the same music, like listening to Lil B, <laughs> bumping the bass guard and shit. After like school, we'd hit each other up and shit, link up, just group of friends linking up together, just chilling every day, like just freestyling. Just, you're not stupid enough to have your 
tongue wags so loosely in front of me. Lie cannot be you. I do not think you're foolish. I will concede that your memory has gone on a journey. I think I realized colorism before race. The first time that I could pin a certain idea or a memory to it was from Bebo days. And there was this really ridiculous, like, phrase or uh, like a sing song that kids used to say whenever they got bullied for, for their color. Um, so in primary school they'd say, oh, uh, you're pink when you're sad, uh, you turn this when you're angry, or you turn green when you puke, so who's the colored one now? It was fun ways of tackling racism and I didn't realize it was racism. You will always hear like stories, you know, there is people that they say stories, you know, something bad happens, you know, racist or something like that. No, I had a really positive experience personally. So like I did have like other, you know, African friends like in Trilly Town where I'd go and visit friends and stuff like that and their experiences might be slightly different. So I kind of was observing it from a slightly outsider but insider kind of perspective where I'm having honest conversations with other people in a similar position but because I'm kind of removed from it and have like a different culturing, I was experiencing it differently. I haven't had the usual overt, you're this. And I don't know if that's better or worse or because when somebody is explicitly racist, at least you could be like, oh, that's what you did and that's definitely what you did. But I think what we encounter more recently in our times is microaggressions. Yeah, I just came in knowing like I'm a different kid. I'd walk into like school and then I would just be like, uh, I just talk with my accent. And then they would, no one would understand what I was saying. They put me in three in because they thought they speak English. I'd be walking down Barbara and literally a guy honks in a car and he's like, da, wash, I just wash my face. I was like, you're in a truck wearing like a tank top right now you can't talk to me right now <laughs> so i was like yeah, just go with your life man i felt like i was starting from scratch here you know i was somebody back home you know i have completely different life back home when i came here i feel like you're starting from scratch if you come in from a different country and english is not your first language it can be challenging so for me to to have a conversation with uh, an irish person or somebody who is living here and speak English was, was challenging because I, I felt like I didn't have a confidence. When I started school, I was like maybe the only black kid in it. There was a kid, but he, he was probably in sister and living skin out of school when I came in. And by the time I was leaving, there was about 40 of us, you know. The way I was treated was different to the way they were treated because they were getting used to, okay, they're black, but also there's more to them than being black, you know. If you are Asian living in Ireland, you heard ni hao at least once a week. No matter where you come from, people call you Ni Hao. Some Asian people think that as a discrimination, but for me, I consider that as an interest. We moved to like Castlemaine village on the side of a mountain in like 2003 or something, and genuinely people might not have seen that many like, that many foreign people walking on a mountain like off the bus going home. In any case, never to mind like uh, an African family. There's a shared camaraderie about certain experiences relating to like colonialism or whatever else and stuff. So maybe there's a, a kind of a natural curiosity as to like, oh, you know, where does your family hail from and la 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 la. And then in the wider context of racial things, it kind of gets like hard to decipher where the intent in that is from. But for me, like for the most part, people were just super curious. They were just like, She's, you know, the faces are changing in Casamine now, and I'm like, yeah. People think, like, you know, when you're bodybuilding, they always think, like, oh, look at this guy, he thinks he's great, he thinks he's big, he thinks this and that, but people like us, like, it's not even like that at all, like, you know, the way we're just kind of like, we look at the sports side of things, the food side of things, and I don't know if I count this as racism, people always say, that's your genetics, that's them black genes, that's them black genetics. And you're like, this work, like it's not even like two hours where like, it's just like kind of rest and relax. It's like we're nearly crying in the gym, especially with the guy that I'm trying with. Like you feel the burn in your legs. Some people like throw it on genetics too much, like, but the work is kind of like 80% as well. Like. You know, I'm lucky I haven't had too much with the racial side of things. And maybe that's because I'm more light skinned than, like my cousins are all really dark skinned <laughs> compared to me, especially because I never see the sunlight. I'm, my skin's lighter. So people might not, you know, know that I am a half Malaysian Indian. What gets to me the most is looks. When you walk into like, you know, a white space and you're kind of looked at like, what's she doing here, you know? Can she even afford to be here? I remember the first time I was called the N-word and I knew what it meant and I was, I was glad that I knew what it meant because I felt like I was able to rise above that, you know. To me, that word doesn't mean 
anything. Yesterday, I actually was um, on my way to this space we're in right now to pick up something. I just was literally outside the door and then two guys walked by me and they said, um, oh, they were like, God, what boat did you come off? And I was so taken aback. I'm lucky I don't experience as bad as like people of color or mixed race people do. Even my mum, my mum's a lot darker than I am. She's experienced worse than I have. And I'm lucky it doesn't happen that much to me. But when it does, I do get so taken aback by it. There's the certain comments, there's certain, there's a YouTube channel dedicated to like Diffusion Lab and my artist that it's like racist. People don't admit they are racist in the first place. That's I think generally what Irish society is like. They will, they're not like outwardly racist. They will not like, you know, call you a nigger to your face. If you're an immigrant and you're just arriving into the country, once you get out of um, direct provision, you are probably going to go to the cheaper places to live, which are more likely outside of the cities, which are more likely in the rural areas. And in the rural areas, you have people who are less exposed to people of all kinds of cultures, so you have more racism. My dad was is from Vietnam. He was uh, he left uh, in 1979. He fled on a boat, left Vietnam, ended up in Hong Kong. From there, the refugees were being kind of dispersed around the world. My dad was one of 212 who went who ended up in Ireland. My dad came over. Him and the other Vietnamese people they would have lived in Blanchardstown Hospital for a time in what you might call the provision esque circumstances, but they lasted weeks, not months, not years, rather. It's a very unfortunate situation because there are so many tragic stories of, of deaths and injuries and assaults in direct provision and it, it seems like it's something that the Irish government is really dragging its heels on. Like it's not really making it a priority. The human experience or the human condition I feel is being able to cook for yourself and for your family at large and that's something that's been stripped away from people who are living in, dir in direct provision and I feel that's a method of removing their humanity in that way. They're like, oh, you know, you don't need to cook for yourself. Like, you, you, you eat the food we give you, you don't need to cook for yourself. It's very infantilizing in that way. Well, first of all, I'd be very surprised if no one has actually heard of direct provision now. Like, it's very much in the media, like you were saying. Look at the charities, you know, for a direct provision. Read the stories, the posts they put up, and then you'll really know. The system is, is massively under insufficient for the needs, and you know, the only way is, is, to, is to abolish the system and start again. The majority of Irish society just wasn't aware of what it is, and that's because of not just a physical marginalization, marginalization so putting direct provision centres so out of the way, away from urban centres, away from, you know, transport links, from schools, from anything like that, just away from society, not just that physical marginalisation, but also like an ideological marginalisation. Like, what I would like to see is, I want, yeah, I'd like to see the whole system being brought down, I'd like to see everybody within the system who's been there for a certain amount of time or who has Irish-born children to be given amnesty and to be immediately um, integrated into Irish society. In, in its place, uh, I would like to see a system that was, that will put a lot more resources into processing applications and it wasn't run for profit and I would end all deportations um, because I think deportations are political violence. <laughs> Seems like that conversation took your mind off things. You better make a list about anything, about important things. You always forget important things. Words mid-conversation, thoughts trail off and you have minimal recollection. Focus, why are you shaking? Don't worry. I'll go soon, but I'll be back. I always struggle in calling myself Irish because everything I think that I do is not considered Irish at all. If you're living what, experiencing what a lot of youth are experiencing, if you're, you know, you're making income for the community, you're giving back to the community, you're doing what you can for the community, you're struggling as the same person that has been here for a time, you're still like part of it. If I apply for Irish passport, that wouldn't make me Irish, you know. What makes me Irish is being loving what I do in a place where I'm based. I feel like it's, it's going to be a different answer for me compared to my little brother that was born over here and doesn't know any different. I'm definitely Nigerian, so I like just a place I've moved to. But I'm definitely, definitely Nigerian. It doesn't matter how long I will live here. If I live here for the rest of my life, I'm still definitely Nigerian. Ireland has influenced me 
I love my, the way I think now, the way I am. I don't know if you do whatever a DNA test, you're gonna realize that you're from places that you never knew. And it's like, damn, I have a little of Asian, I have a little from Africa, it's just, I think I could be Irish inside somewhere. In Korea, like, they believe that adding sugar is not really good for your health. So instead of sugar, we try to use lots of fruits. So pineapple, kiwi, pear, all this kind of stuff. In Korea, we have a food culture called banchan. Banchan means like a side dishes. So if you go to any restaurant in Korea, they will give you at least five, six different types of banchan for free. I definitely think we as immigrants have contributed to sort of like a, a rich tapestry of like social life and cultural life and, and political life as well. I think in the, the creative circle has, or the creative communities has benefited incredibly because you have somebody bringing a sound or a way of even um, rapping or a cadence or a flow that's different to yours. Even just by hanging out with these people, yours could be influenced or yours could change. One of the exciting things about multiculturalism in, in the creative culture here is that fusion, that, um, that space. When I first came here, like, a lot of kids like in my school were bumping like mad like disco dance shit, right? And then about like three years ago, kids are bumping Gucci Gang by Lil like Lil Pump and stuff like. My even the young kids right now like from here like they're absorbing like every different culture from the internet. I think what I see is my sister's generation, my sister's 17, and then my brother's generation, my brother's 12. I don't even know if it registers that like they literally have mates from different walks of life and it's like with them it's like they don't give a toss which is amazing to see that there's just no register because to them it's like yeah we're all Irish and all our parents are from different places like so what you know what I mean? So I've been recently doing um, some family history and our cousin <laughs> Moses mm -hmm. um, came to Dublin I think he's the earliest one I can find in 1934 to study law and trinity my grandfather came to study in the Royal College of Surgeons in the 50s, and I'd love hearing those stories, and I'd love if they were also alive to be able to talk to and ask them what, what was Dublin like back then, what was their experiences? Are there any echoes in that for us now? And I'd say they would be amazed now to walk the streets of Dublin and hear you're about in the streets. <laughs> you know, they, they would have blown their minds, mm -hmm. probably from the 50s and the 30s, to see what it would be like now. Mm -hmm. That's less than 100 years of like a, a, a transformation. Change in the journey. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's really cool. You know, I would see myself as Irish and I'm also Vietnamese. And when I was growing up, I loved fucking kung fu movies, right? I think the reason was. You didn't see Asian people, like you didn't see people who looked like my family on TV, but you could see them in these kung fu movies and it was kind of just a way of like asserting my sense of, of being Asian. It's important I think to make sure kids grow up seeing a diverse uh, spectrum of people who look like them and what they can achieve. I think it's important to be for people what they might not need, they know they need. The reason why I say that is for instance, um, when I did Boy Child last September with Fringe and I remember one of the biggest things that stuck to me was, I think after the end of a show, somebody came up to me and was a big black guy, you know, he's a big man, you know, he's grown. He's like in his 20s, he came up to me, he strutted up and he goes, yo, Felicia. And I was like, hey, what's up? And he's like, you know, like, now I understand why white people go to theater. I said, what? Tell me more. He goes, it's so, interesting seeing myself being represented on stage. Why I say it's important to represent people that don't even realize they need your representation is because of moments like that. That moment where somebody finally goes, oh shit, I see myself in this art that I never thought was important to me. Listen to yourself breathing, inhale, exhale. Record each deafening heartbeat. One, two, your throat is getting dry. Lick your lips, feel saliva from it, go on. You're going to need it. Notice your limbs, 
Your arms are desperately trying to be apart from you in one minute the next. You're holding your body, begging yourself to cooperate. Your toes are curling now. There's nothing sexy about your toes curling now. But your feet remembers that fear means run, but today they paralyze. I'm torturing you, aren't I? I mean, I don't mean to. Actually, I do.